Thanks, Vijay. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, I have a few uh, opening remarks I'll make, and I'm going to sort of lay out for you the um, what I intend to, to lecture about in my three lectures. I'll spend some time at the board just doing um, some verbal things at the beginning. Um, in each lecture, I, I've, I've taught a course for many years that is an hour and a half per lecture, and I find it necessary to take a break in the middle of that hour and a half. So at some point in the middle of each lecture, we'll take a five-minute break, just a, a physiology break, as it were. Um, uh, so uh, what I've decided to, to talk to you about could be called broadly um, the evolution of genetic systems. Uh, that's a vast subject, and I feel somewhat arrogant even saying that I'm going to talk about that. Um, but I will. I'll try to talk about it. Um, why is it of interest? Um, we typically, in evolutionary genetics, have, um, with some exceptions in, in the 20th century, taken the, the genetic system of a population, that is, its mechanisms of creating new variation, mutation, genetic recombination. We've taken that as a given and developed our models of how evolution would proceed from that, um, from that, uh, that given. Um, but it's also an interesting question to ask how the very system itself, the typical mutation rate of a population, whether it undergoes genetic recombination, etc., how that very system itself uh, evolves. And this has been a subject of interest for me for some years. I have most of those years, in fact, almost all of them, worked on uh, the evolution of mutation rates experimentally. Um, and so that's most of what I'm going to show you. I'm going to focus on a kind of tour of the experimental results that myself and my collaborators have gotten over around 20 years of work. Along the way, we'll talk generally, we'll make forays into other things. If time allows, in the last lecture, I will move into talking a little bit about uh, the evolution of genetic recombination, that is, the exchange of genes between individuals in populations. Um, uh, we, will, we will talk about recombination anyway during the earlier parts of the lectures because it will turn out to be important to the perspective I will try to develop. So. Here is what I propose for the three lectures that I will do. We will start today very, very broadly with some words that are on the, on the page here, um, talking about something that might be called evolvability um, and its relevance to the evolution of genetic systems. The remarks will be very general, maybe even embarrassingly so, but I find it useful, at least for me, to start at this very general level. We'll then move today into an introduction to ideas about the evolution of uh, the mutation rate itself, the genomic mutation rate. We'll go over in tomorrow's lecture, I believe I lecture at the same time tomorrow, we'll go over a lot of uh, experimental work on the evolution of mutation rates uh, tomorrow. Um, and in the final lecture, which will be Thursday, we'll sort of wrap up that uh, evolution of mutation rate work. And then, as I said, if there's time, we'll, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about the evolution of recombination um, and sort of define the problem and maybe look at certain things. I want to urge you um, to ask questions at any time. That, to me, always makes the job of lecturing easier. Um, and I'm in particular concerned that if you have, um, since I know many of you come from uh, more of a physics background, if there's some aspect of the biology that I'm going to be talking about um, that I just sort of glibly throw out and that you need to know in order to understand what I'm talking about, just ask. Please don't. Um, I'll be happy to, to explain it to the level we need to know it. Um, 
That said, what I will tell you is that um, we will not, uh, there's this expression that people are using in the States, we, we won't go out into the weeds very often with the biology. Where I'm going to talk about, I want to, what I would like to do is talk about just enough of the biology to get to the processes involved, the dynamical processes within populations, and those are my interests. So I, I promise you I won't bog us down in, in uh, too much biological detail. You can hold me to that promise, uh, I hope. Okay, so some introductory comments on the evolution of genetic systems. Um, there's a, uh, an old book by John Maynard Smith, who some of you may uh, know who he was. He was a, a very great uh, British population geneticist, evolutionary geneticist, on the evolution of sex, that is sexual reproduction and recombination. And um, he makes, and, and the 12th chapter of that book, he talks about the evolution of mutation rates. And he makes this, what for me is a really nice, useful comment to frame at the beginning of my lectures. He says that um, these things, the evolution of mutation rates, the evolution of sex, are really fascinating questions because the phenomena involved, mutational change or re-scrambling of genetic variation in the case of sex and recombination, the phenomena involved affect both the well-being of individual organisms in the population and the future of the population. So it's, a, it's an intrinsically complex problem to think about these things. You have to think about the effect that mutation has on individuals. You also have to think about the effect that mutation or recombination have uh, on the population itself. And that latter thing, thinking of the future well-being of a population, um, gets us around to this issue of evolvability. Um, which has sort of been in the literature a lot lately. So I'm going to write the word up here. I've written certain things about evolvability over the years. Um, and then I'm going to sort of um, distinguish between two hypotheses about, I'm going to tell you what might affect evolvability, but I'm going to discuss a little bit two hypotheses uh, for the existence of evolvability differences among populations. Evolvability itself might be an adaptation. Or evolvability might be a byproduct of other things that have occurred during the evolutionary history of a population. So what do we mean by evolvability? It's very hard when you talk about evolvability not to lapse into a circular definition. Uh, evolvability is the capacity of a population to evolve. <clears throat> um, what does that mean? Uh, the capacity, perhaps, for a population to adapt by natural selection. That's one possible way of thinking of it. Okay? It could also be the possibility or the capacity of a population to generate significant evolutionary novelty over long stretches of time. Uh, formerly legless populations of organisms evolving legs. And it might be that that has something to do with evolvability, for instance. I'm going to focus on the first definition, which is we will say that evolvability is the capacity of a population to adapt by natural selection over time. And it is the case that populations differ, populations in nature differ greatly uh, in their capacity to adapt by natural selection. And so let me give you some of the things that might affect uh, evolvability. And in fact, let's call it evolvability, and then I will put in parentheses adaptability. <clears throat> 
Oh, and let me make sure here that when I write adaptability, you know that what I mean is adapt by natural selection. In other words, not adapt purely by changing the phenotype of organisms, but not their genetics. So, for example, in the northern hemisphere, uh, there's a type of hare or rabbit called the snowshoe hare, which undergoes seasonal adaptation in its coat color. Uh, in the winter, the coat color is white. That obviously has camouflage uh, value. Uh, in the summer, the coat color is grayish brown. That has camouflage value. Uh, and that's just happening at the level of individuals switching their coat color. That's not the kind of adaptability we're talking about. We're talking here about the ability of a population to respond to natural selection. So what are some sources of differences in adaptability or evolvability? Obviously, different amounts of genetic variation. Linked to fitness. Now, this leads me to say what fitness is in evolutionary terms. Fitness of organisms is their capacity to survive and or reproduce. And fitness differences among organisms are what drive or what produce the, the sort of epiphenomenon of natural selection. And insofar as those fitness differences are linked to genetic variation that is reliably passed from parents to offspring, in other words, heritable, then a population can respond to natural selection. And so different amounts of such ger genetic variation in different populations perforce will mean that they have a different capacity uh, to respond to natural selection, all other things being equal. Well, the ultimate source of variation, as we will be discussing at some length in these lectures, is mutation. So differing rates of mutation might also result in evolvability differences. How might this work? Well, I'm going to write, I will write mutation rate as um, a big U here. That's typical in population genetics. So a higher U means more genetic variation, all other things being equal. A higher mutation rate also might mean something else kind of interesting. And the extent to which it's important is a little mysterious, I think, for most populations. Let us imagine that we have a population and it's very well adapted to its current environment. And now the environment changes. And let's imagine that when the environment changes, our population doesn't contain a key genetic change, a mutation, that would allow it to adapt to that environment. It must instead wait for that mutation to arise in the population in order to adapt to that environment. Um, higher mutation rate, on average, will reduce the waiting time for that good mutation to arise. And so we can write here reduced waiting time. Now, the reason I say it's a little mysterious is that, and I'm going to write here for Ben Mute. And what that means is beneficial mutation, okay? Something that will adapt you to the environment. The reason, um, the reason it's, I, I say there's a, a little bit of a mystery as to whether that advantage applies in real populations in nature 
is that most real populations in nature have quite a lot of genetic variation in them. And so there's some question as to how often in, out there in the real world of nature, a population has to wait for a new beneficial mutation. Could it be the case that such beneficial mutations are sort of present at um, uh, a low frequency and then the environment changes and, and the population doesn't have to wait for them to arise? Or do populations actually have to wait? This is one of those questions that so often arises when you start thinking about evolution and that if you had you know, you know, a sort of godlike perspective about natural populations, you might know the answer or some answers to, the, to it. Uh, often we don't know such answers. We can approach such questions either theoretically or we can approach them in, exp in an experimental evolution context. And the latter, the experimental evolution context, is what I will spend uh, some time talking about. I won't actually address this specific, specific issue that much in what I discuss. Um, now, there's another one. Another factor that could affect uh, evolvability and adaptability, um, and that is, <coughs> excuse me, different rates of recombination. In the example I just gave you, I spoke as if what a population needed in order to adapt to its environment was um, a key new beneficial mutation, one. Might be one nucleotide change in the genome or something like that. In reality, it may be that what populations need in order to adapt is new combinations of previously existing mutations. Uh, and those new combinations uh, can be more readily assembled in a population uh, that has a higher rate of recombination. That is, a population in which individuals containing different but complementary mutations can swap those and assemble a uh, genome containing both of them. And so differing rates of recombination can affect evolvability as well. There are some other processes or, or uh, phenomena that can affect evolvability. I'll translate what this means. I've written up here differing mutational spectra. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, and I will show a slide in a little while in this morning's lecture that sort of makes mutation out, genetic mutation out, to be a very, very simple thing. You have a genome with the four nucleotide bases, A, C, T, and G, and mutations are just instances I will show you in this, I will assert in this slide, but then vastly qualify it. They're just instances of changing individual letters. But that's not really the whole story by any means. There are all kinds of other phenomena which we group under the large umbrella of mutation um, in genomes. They include things like changes in the copy number of existing genes, rearrangements of genome structure, um, the insertion of things that we call transposable elements, which are um, entities that jump around and replicate themselves within the genome. All of these things can produce different kinds of mutational effects. They might, for example, um, strongly affect the regulation of, of a gene or a set of genes in a way that maybe might not be attainable by a simple point mutation, the simple alteration of one of the base sites in the genome. And so you might imagine, and this is all I really want to say at this point, you might imagine that um, populations with differing mutational spectra, for instance, a population that has transposable elements versus one that does not have transposable elements, would, as a consequence, have different adaptabilities or evolvabilities. Another sort of large grouping of phenomena that might affect uh, evolvability is 
genetic architecture. Let me uh, translate what I mean by that. So this, this, this can have to do with a lot of different things, but I'll give you examples. So for example, is the genome that we're talking about diploid or haploid? That is, do individuals contain two copies, one from mom, one from dad? Uh, or do they contain one copy? That's a large architectural difference. Another one might be um, the number of chromosomes. That the population has. Another one, and one that has been talked about a lot in the evolvability literature, has been called the modularity of the genome. So let me talk first about how the number of chromosomes might affect adaptability or evolvability. Um, in a very simple way, you might imagine that the more chromosomes you have, the easier it is to sort of reshuffle the contents of those chromosomes into offspring. If everything is linked up in one chromosome and you never break that and rejoin it uh, in reproduction, then everything carries together from one generation to the next. If you have more and more and more chromosomes, you might imagine the limit at which every gene resides on its own chromosome, right? Uh, then there's the possibility to shuffle these um, in, uh, you know, uh, astronomical combinations. Um, and this circles back to something I already wrote. Obviously, this this relates to the potential for the rate of recombination in the population. Here's another possibility um, of differences in genetic architecture. We know that in the history of life, there have been rounds of genome duplication. So don't, uh, don't let me confuse you. This is different from whether a population is diploid versus haploid. Um, in the history of vertebrates, there have been more than one round in which the genome has essentially been doubled up, copied, and two copies will now be carried from generation to generation, or four, or eight, and so forth. And uh, you might imagine that if uh, populations differ in the amount of genome duplication that has been part of their past evolutionary history, they might also differ in their evolvability, because what that might allow them to do is, since you now have extra copies of genes, you can change some and keep others the same, right? Again, speaking very simply here. So now to circle back to where I started with what I've put on the board so far, all of the above, all of these kinds of differences among populations uh, exist between taxonomic groups and even between populations within species in nature. So these things are not, this isn't made up stuff. <laughs> This is stuff that exists in real biological populations in nature. And so, per force, there are differences in evolvability among populations in nature. And a key question in thinking about evolvability, in my view, um, is to ask um, how these differences themselves evolved. That is to say, given that we perceive differences in mutation rate, for example, or amounts of genetic variation, or differing mutational spectra, or differing genetic architectures between taxa and populations, um, how did those differences arise? And this gets us back to these two possibilities. <laughs> 
And I'm going to set them out as starkly sort of mutually exclusive possibilities, though they in some sense may not be, because evolution is, um, doesn't you know, conform to um, simple categories sometimes. But we might imagine that evolvability differences between populations or evolve the evolvability capacity of a population is an adaptation of that population itself. That, yes. Right. To the, right. Uh, like, to the bird. right. So the question was, can I talk about the difference between the number of chromosomes and modularity? Um, modularity is um, often referred to as, um, or, or one of the contexts in which it's discussed is uh, in the regulatory architecture of the genome. So it is the case that you have these things called transcription factors that are produced by genes. Those transcription factors are proteins that bind the regions that turn on and off other genes. And the extent to which, um, this is one way in which modularity is discussed, the extent to which um, large groups of genes are under the control of fairly limited numbers of transcription factors, and the structure of that is, is one example of modularity of the kind that I was referring to. And you could imagine that different structures of modularity allow for different kinds of um, uh, evolution in a population. Thanks, and please, any other questions? Kavita. Population size, yeah, we can we certainly put that down as well. Thank you. <laughs> and in fact, we, I may, if I get around to it, I may show some, some results that are, that are relevant to that from experiments. A larger population, uh, all other things being equal, will also have more variability. It will also have a larger population with the same mutation rate as a smaller population will nonetheless have a higher mutation supply rate because the mutation supply rate is the product of the mutation rate and the population size. Ah, mutational spectra, yes, go over that again. Um, so the idea of mutational spectra is that um, uh, well, let me, let me explain it by example. Let us imagine a population in which um, the only kinds of mutations that can occur are one at a time point mutational changes of individual nucleotide sites in the genome. And now let's compare that to a population in which those point mutations can occur, but also various kinds of rearrangements, um, insertions, uh, jumping around of large pieces of genetic material can also occur. And those rearrangements and insertions and jumping around, they might preserve in some sense um, chunks of coding material, but put them in different juxtapositions to one another. And so you might imagine that this, that this second population has a different evolvability from the first, because uh, perhaps like a computer programmer, you know, in this first population, the programmer can only go in and change one letter at a time in a line. Over here, you can copy and paste and move things around in addition to changing one letter at a time. Right, so it affects, it affects what mutations are possible, and that is what I'm referring to as mutational spectra, the range of kinds of mutations that are possible. Okay, good, good. Okay, so, um, so I've, I've laid out this difference between evolvability as adaptation and evolvability as byproduct. Um, and now what I want to do is, is to start thinking about what it means if we say evolvability of a population is an adaptation. What do we, what do we mean by that? Um, for me, at least, what it means is that some regime of past natural selection has favored the installation in the population by natural selection, 
of features that affect evolvability, that increase evolvability. Um, I'm, I'm being very careful in saying that because that exactly parallels how we think about the evolution of adaptations of individual organisms within a population. The past environment, for example, favored cold tolerance in a population of small mammals. Those small mammals that had variation that um, allowed them to resist cold better, survived well, perhaps left more offspring. On the whole, the population moves toward increased cold tolerance. That's what we mean, you know, that's what we mean in natural, when we talk about evolutionary adaptation, that's the, the scenario that we have. And so um, evolvability as adaptation must then mean, if, if that's our hypothesis, that the past has somehow favored installation of features that increase the capacity of a population to adapt. Right? Now this then raises some interesting kind of logical questions. The, the first and easiest criticism that always has been made of this evolvability as adaptation argument is the teleological criticism. That is to say, uh, it, it sort of it's presupposes that a population prepares itself for the future, right? Um, whereas we know populations cannot see the future. Um, and that's a criticism that most people who discuss evolvability bring up. I myself have, have brought it up. I don't think it's necessarily a very powerful criticism. It's an important one to make. It's not that powerful because in the same way that I discussed selection changing the cold tolerance of, uh, of uh, the average cold tolerance of individuals in a small population of mammals, you might imagine that selection changes the average evolvability of a set of populations or groups um, over time, as long as there was the right past selective environment favoring evolvability. And what would that past selective environment be? Well, it would have to be something like an environment that's extremely changeable or that constantly demands adaptation of the population. So if that's the case, then we maybe have a condition under which we could have natural selection favoring an increase in evolvability. But that leads us to another couple of problems or considerations to think about. Um, I have been very careful not to say how selection for evolvability would work in the scenario I just mentioned. And now let me say that, well, if we're talking about populations being differentially evolvable, some more evolvable than others, then we're really talking about evolvability as a population level feature. After all, it's populations that evolve, not individuals. It is populations that evolve by natural selection. So what that then suggests is that where selection occurs to increase evolvability is among groups or among populations. Let's go back to the small mammal example I just gave. That's a straightforward example of individual level or gene level selection. Individuals have varying amounts of cold resistance. Those individuals carrying genes uh, that form a heritable basis for cold resistance survive better, leave more offspring. On average, the population of individuals moves toward increased cold resistance. Now think about evolvability. Well, it must be the case that we have populations that differ in evolvability. And if we want to say evolvability is a population level adaptation, then the statistical sorting that takes place takes place among those populations. And a population that has higher evolvability survives and reproduces better, whatever that means at the population level, than other populations. So we've moved to a sort of group level selective phenomenon here um, in talking about evolvability as adaptation. Now, 
that group level selective phenomenon or sorting has gone for a long time in evolutionary biology by the name group selection. And it, in, in the 20th century, there was a fairly ugly history of debate about it. Um, it was argued very strongly that group selection should not be effective. Um, and there are some reasons why group selection should be weaker than individual level selection for sure. For example, by definition, there are fewer groups than there are individuals. If you take a certain number of individuals and cut it up into groups, unless each group contains only one individual, there are fewer groups than there are individuals. And so that means the force of selection will not be as effective on groups as it is on individuals, probably. There's also the problem of what a heritable group trait means. Well, it must mean that the individuals of which the group is composed uh, themselves encode genetic factors affecting uh, the trait of interest, perhaps of all ability. And then there's the problem of what the generation time of a group might be. Selective processes in nature operate on a sort of generation time basis. The generation time of groups is, it's unclear what that would be. But having said those things about the weakness of group selection or the, or the uh, controversial nature of group selection, um, we can't rule out that selection operates among groups in nature. Um, it could be that it does, or it could be that selection at the level of individuals favors features that are also favored at the level of groups. And so we could get, for example, evolvability differences um, in that way. But this then brings up a question, which is, if we imagine that there might be selection among groups that differ in their evolvability as sort of defined up here, um, we've, we've kind of, in, in imagining that, we've sort of assumed the thing that we needed to demonstrate to start with which is how the differences between groups arose. You see, there's a logical problem there. We still have the problem of how differences between groups arise if we're going to select among groups. And it must be the case that there's some sort of process within groups that causes them to change, individual groups to change with respect to evolvability properties. Is that... Is that is it clear? So if we assume differences among groups to start with, then we've sort of assumed the thing <laughs> that, we, <laughs> that we needed. And instead, we have to show how those differences um, uh, could have or can arise. Yes? So are you suggesting there's a hierarchy of these uh, differences? Uh, so the question is, that, am I suggest? I guess they can hear you, sorry. <laughs> um, is there a hierarchy of selective uh, effects. That is the way in which people have thought about this. You might imagine, and let me, I can just sort of sketch that out for you. You might within genomes uh, have selection at the level of, um, uh, not even at the level of the individual organism, but at the level of different genomic factors that preferentially spread within a genome. Transposable elements are an example of this. They can be thought of as computer worms that um, spread at the expense of the host, probably, and they spread simply by virtue of their ability to copy faster than the host DNA. Or you might imagine, as we've discussed, selection amongst individual genomes or between alleles at individual genetic loci because of properties that affect the well-being of individual organisms, survival and reproduction. Then you can go up another level and we might imagine groups of individuals within a population which have been given the name deems in evolutionary literature. And there might be selection among those groups. Then there might be selection between species. Then there might be selection between larger taxonomic and um, people have only, I think, been limited by their imaginations in coming up with these kinds of nested scenarios. Thanks.
Okay, so I think we'll, um, if we could have the, the screen down, we're gonna, I'm going to put the first slide up and just sort of introduce a framework for thinking about the evolution of differences in mutation rate or any other sort of difference in evolvability among populations. It's a very specific population genetic framework. It's just, we'll do it by virtue of a picture. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll take a little break and jump into uh, lecture on screen. Excuse me. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so in the first point you mentioned, the yeah. different amounts of genetic variation linked to fitness. So that, does that account for the difference in selective effects as in the selection coefficient or something like that? Does that uh, change the evolvability? So what I mean by different, different amounts of genetic variation linked to fitness can be made clear in the following way. Um, there are certain kinds of genetic variation in populations which um, don't affect fitness. They, so genomes contain, for example, intergenic regions, some of which have no effect on gene expression and regulation. They're just stuff that's there, and you can change that stuff. That stuff can be extraordinarily variable and have no effect on fitness. So what I mean is differing amounts of variation that actually affect the fitness of, of organisms instead of just neutral variation. Now there's a subtlety there as well, and this relates to population size, uh, because in a small population, things that in a larger population visibly affect fitness and are affected by selection won't. Uh, be affected by selection because of the interaction between genetic drift um, and selection. And I will probably have occasion to talk about that a little more. Hold I turned it off. There you go. <laughs> yeah. All of the cost of a mutation or the uh, what do you call it, selection coefficient in this thing, evolvability, does that really matter or? Um, I suppose it does. It, it's, quite, it's, quite, um, it's quite complex. I may as well write something up on the board here. I'll write two things up on the board um, that, that relate to this. I'm going to draw an arrow. That's the, that was the thing about differing amounts of genetic variation. Um, so there's a... There's a mathematical object in quantitative genetics called heritability. I don't know if you've had that, right? So uh, if they've gone over that. And so um, heritability in the narrow sense is it's a ratio of variances. And it's defined as the total additive genetic variance in a, in a given population at a given time at a given place to the total ratio, to, to the total uh, phenotypic variance. This additive genetic variance has a, a very careful and specific definition. And what that definition has to do with is the correlation between parents and offspring. There are some kinds of variation that don't on average get path, that don't on average contribute to resemblance between parents and offspring. Uh, these are effects due to dominance and epistasis and so forth. <clears throat> so the additive component of variation is what contributes to heritability. Obviously, this additive genetic variance is related to the total amount of nucleotide variability in a population. The, the amount of, you know, at the molecular level can be related to the amount of genetic variability. And populations that differ in their heritability then differ in their ability to respond to selection. Um, so the way in which quantitative genetics uh, models selection is that the response to selection, the amount by which the phenotype of a population changes, for instance, if we have our lizards or our uh, small mammal that I was talking about, and we're asking for a certain percentage change in cold tolerance, uh, the response to selection, so this would be the percentage change we're asking for, the big S, the response is proportional to the heritability. And heritability ranges between zero and one by definition. 
So does that sort of address address your question? So it's a, it's a, there's a clear link here, and and in fact that kind of evolvability difference that I just wrote on the board is completely uncontroversial. It exists. It's out there in nature. Uh, it it is put to practical use by plant breeders, by animal breeders, um, who select for um, changes in the properties of the populations they work with. Okay. Um, okay, so where we were was at the point of asking questions about how within a population, by sorting among individuals in a population, evolvability differences. Sorry, is a question? Yes. Yeah, I just want to find out whether um, the intergenic regions have any importance during um, splicing, gene splicing, exactly or right. alternative yeah. splicing. Right. So. I think my mic went, there we go. Um, so the question was intergenic regions. I said something about some of it being just stuff. Yeah, and that's what you're asking about. And that's why I was very careful to say some of it. <laughs> and there's considerable interest in just exactly how much of intergenic regions in say the human genome or other mammal or any, any genome that has intergenic regions, which are largely uh, the genomes of creatures like ourselves. Um, how much of that is of functional importance and how much is not? Um, modern genomic studies, some of them have claimed to find a large amount of functional importance. I think it still is beyond a doubt that some intergenic material has no functional importance for individuals. Some does, some of it, and, and the way in which we find typically the stuff that does have functional importance is to look for con evolutionary conservation across species and higher taxonomic levels. And if we find conservation of sequence, what that means is despite the fact that those sequences are being mutated constantly, selection is weeding out mutants um, because of some function that that sequence serves. It might see, serve as an enhancer uh, for genes. There are all kinds of things it could do. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, let me see if I can uh, get, the, get the picture to appear here. Okay, that's good. It's hard to believe it's 17 years ago. Is that, that might not be right. <laughs> I think that was 2005, not 2000. Um, at any rate, what is this? So um, a student of mine and I wrote something on evolvability, just a verbal commentary um, that appeared in Current Biology in 2005. Um, and we're going to see other pictures like this. It's a way of sort of um, visualizing how evolvability might change in a population. And so let me explain what we've got here. Time goes from top to bottom, and each line can be thought of as perhaps a generation, a new generation in a population, so each, each horizontal level. And each of these little line segments would be a genome of that population at a given um, time period. It need not, this need not be generation by generation. It could be 10 generations at a time, whatever. OK, and this red thing here, this red thing is going to be what we might call an evolvability allele in the population. It's a genetic variant that changes one of those things we were talking about. And since we're going to mostly talk about mutation rates and mutation rate changes, um, let's let that red thing be a thing that raises the mutation rate of the genome in which it resides. And the jargon we will use from now on to refer to that red thing is we'll call it a mutator. So it raises the mutation rate above the, the sort of prevailing wild type rate in the population. OK, and now there's this blue square here. And let's let this blue square be a beneficial mutation. And this is a mutation that increases the survival and or reproduction of its bearer in the population. And so by the process of natural selection, which I know you've um, uh, encountered in some of the earlier lectures, we expect that blue square to spread through the population. Bearers of that blue square 
on average do better, they have more offspring, they survive better, it spreads. It spreads perhaps to fixation. That's the jargon that we use, frequency one. And now we have this black square here. This black square and the other black squares that arise, those are deleterious mutations. So in real physical terms, those are mutational changes in coding sites in the genome that impair survival and reproduction to a degree that actually affects the fitness of the individual in which they occur. Now, um, we know from actual measurements, but we also know from sort of kind of fundamental logic that's related to an experiment I'll show you later, that the rate at which deleterious mutations arise in genomes is far greater than the rate at which beneficial mutations arise. The sort of logical reason for this is that, as far as we know, mutations arise in a manner that is indifferent to their effects on the individual. The, the, the troubling word that gets used for this is that mutations are random. That gets you into all sorts of arguments when you talk to people. I like the word indifferent better. That is to say, mutations just happen, and among the ones that affect the well-being of individuals, then it's overwhelmingly more likely that they will, uh, in a well-adapted population, reduce fitness rather than increase it. Just to go with one more analogy, think of a mutation as a, a random change in an automobile engine. So you, you, you pop up the, uh, the hood or the bonnet and uh, you close your eyes and you take a large pair of pliers and just go in there and change something. <laughs> you're very unlikely to improve performance. It's not out of the question. You might accidentally adjust something to make the engine run better, but it's more likely that in reaching in and, you know, blindly making a change, you will impair fitness. So the fact that these deleterious mutations are more common than beneficial ones raises a problem, at least in a population that recombines. It raises a problem for carrying this mutator allele to high frequency because the mutator allele is going to be associated with more deleterious mutations than its wild type counterpart. It will produce more deleterious mutations per generation. And if there's no recombination in the population, the mutator allele will be linked to those deleterious mutations, but it will be also linked to any beneficial mutation it has allowed to occur. But if there is recombination in the population, what will happen is that the mutator allele will become disassociated from the beneficial mutation on average. Because what recombination ultimately can be thought of as doing is randomizing the combinations of alleles within genomes in a population. And so what can happen then if we have recombination, and that's what's assumed here, is that the mutator allele sinks out of the population or drops to very low frequency based on its much more likely association with newly arising deleterious mutations. And the beneficial allele, if it arose in association with the mutator, escapes from it by recombination and spreads through the population. And so this scenario tells us that there's a, potentially a problem with within a population evolving evolvability differences. You're going to see that recombination is key here. I'm going to show you experiments in which there is no recombination, and then we'll circle back to some that we've tried in which there was recombination. In experiments in which there is no recombination, I will show you that it's possible for this mutator allele to sort of hitch a ride up to high frequency in the population. But this is a, so this could be an allele that increases some other feature of evolvability too, mutational spectrum, one thing or another. Okay, I think it's a good time for a short break. So we will resume in five minutes, which by my watch is just about 10.30. Short physiology break. Are we going at about the right speed? Is this okay? Good. 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 And then we're gonna start I'm gonna start talking about, you know, experiments and things, but yeah. I love that.
of this reminds me of Kavli. It's just this fundamental thinking that people love to do and the questions about, yeah, it's great. When people, when people came to our workshop, I remember they would, some would ask me, well, how many slides should I bring? And I'd say, bring about 12 slides and expect to talk for an hour and a half. <laughs> so I just think it's great. It's great. I, I probably have way too much prepared, but we'll just go at whatever rate works and, and then handle the rest of it by talking. Yeah. Where are we for time? Are we? Yeah, I guess we should start again. Yeah. So, I don't know if this is on. It's not on yet. We're about ready to start again. I'm just, there we go. I was going to say I'm waiting for the mic. <laughs> okay, so now we'll, we'll start. Um, uh, I won't write on the board except insofar as questions arise and, and uh, helping to answer them by writing on the board uh, is necessary. But now we're going to start going through um, a sort of canned lecture that I've, I've put together. Um, and we're going to start very, very um, fundamentally here. So I want to first just start with uh, some comments about mutation. So you already know a lot of what's on here. Um, go to the second point here. To a first approximation, we can think of mutations as typographical errors or misprints that arise during genome replication. You already know from what we said earlier that that's not quite the whole story. It's ju not just a matter of letters being changed. Uh, it's also pieces of chapters being moved around, paragraphs being changed, uh, word order being inverted, things like that. But the key thing is that these things arise in a manner that is indifferent with respect to the fitness uh, of the organism. Uh, and I was involved in lots of debate <laughs> about this because there have been periodically claims that mutation is not indifferent, that organisms make the mutations they need when they need them. Um, and I'd love to talk about that if anybody's interested, but that I'm not going to go over you know, that story here. The consensus still is that mutations are indifferent or random. Given that that's the case, then, then when we think about it, uh, Richard, when we think about evolution, mutation raises a paradox. And this is the paradox. As I already said, random changes in the genome are far more likely to be harmful than beneficial. Yet in the long run, evolutionary adaptation depends on the occurrence of mutation. If the first organism that ever evolved had had a zero mutation rate, which is impossible, but let's imagine it did, then that population of the first organism would have either gone extinct or it would still be here now, no different from the way it was when it arose. So the pattern of biological variability and ad adaptation that we observe now ultimately traces back to the occurrence of mutations Despite the fact, fact, that most mutations that affect uh, the fitness of organisms are bad for organisms. I find that a really fascinating paradox. And so, um, again, just by way of fundamentals, uh, you know, DNA molecule replication is semi-conservative, as shown here. And I've written over here a little schema for, you know, part of uh, the way in which mutations arise. So DNA is polymerized five prime to three prime, as is RNA in those organisms that have RNA genomes. And in DNA genomes, um, just the error rate due to that polymerization is about one in 100,000 base sites incorrectly incorporated. Well, it's knocked down a couple orders of magnitude by a proofreading function in most organisms. Most organisms, the polymerase itself has a subunit that then goes back and resynthesizes stuff um, and, and proofreads. Uh, and then there are various forms of DNA repair that occur post replication and post proofreading that knock the error rate down a couple more orders of magnitude. 
Now, what we're looking at here is mostly just for point mutations. There, are, as, you, as I pointed out, there are many other types of mutations that may occur. The point in showing you this, though, is the following, and it's a concept that I'll, I'll probably use and talk about. In much the same way as we might imagine that there are, let's say, in the human population, an unknown number of genetic loci that affect physical stature. Right? There are genetic loci that affect your physical stature. How much milk you get affects your physical stature as well, or how much calcium you get uh, in your upbringing. But there are genetic, but we don't know how many there are. We know there are probably a very large number. We can think of that as the sort of um, the stature genome, whatever it is. Well, we can also think of a mutation rate genome. There are, there's an evolved apparatus that's encoded in genes in a fairly large number of genes, we don't even know the number, whose products affect the mutation rate. So the mutation rate is a phenotype affected by genetic variation. Obviously, you know, changes in genes involved in post-replicated DNA repair might affect the mutation rate. Changes in genes involved in proofreading, changes in genes involved in polymerizing DNA in the first place. So amongst individuals within a population, there can be genetic variability for the tendency to produce mutations. Yeah. Uh, so what you're getting to, yeah. So the question was, well, then how does genetic variability influence the red? So, so again, this is one of the things I find so fascinating is that Genetic variability can influence the rate of mutation, which can then, in some sense, feed back to influence genetic variability, including the variability that influences mutation, right? And so we'll, we'll, we'll actually see some results later that I think are, are, um, are, are related to that. Yeah. So for now, let's leave it as a sort of rhetorical question. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> um, uh, Variation, genetic variation, process of adaptation. Um, I'm not sure what good this slide is, but, but we go, go along the, the, the black text and the arrows here. This is the classical way we think of how a population evolves. Variation arises at random. Selection sorts among that variation um, for those variants that, or combinations of variants that confer higher fitness. The result is adaptation. But could one of those adaptations or could one of those results be a change in the rate at which variation itself is produced? Could there be a feedback? I forgot that was the next slide. I think that to some extent schematizes your question. It doesn't answer it. I'm not sure it's an easy answer. Okay, so here are a couple figures with which we can think about, begin to think about mutation rate evolution. And let's look at the first panel A here. Um, and so what we have on the y-axis is uh, mutation rate, and you can think of that as genomic mutation rate, number of mutations produced per genome per generation. And then the x here is just defining various kinds of selective forces that might affect the mutation rate. And let's look at this large uh, greenish arrow here. Um, and there's a term mutational load, which perhaps has come up in the population genetics you've had so far. But it is the, the reduction in average fitness of the population due to the carriage of deleterious mutations. What you have to realize is that those de deleterious mutations are never completely eliminated from populations. Selection opposes them, but they continually arise every generation. And so they reach some mutation selection level and equilibration between those forces, and that level will reduce uh, the average fitness of the population. A genome that has a higher mutation rate has a higher mutational load, and so that will produce selection to decrease the mutation rate. And we call that selection indirect. What is meant by this? What is meant by this is that the gene that raises the mutation rate itself is not affecting the fitness. If you carry that gene, you, as a result of the gene product that that gene produces, you probably survive and reproduce just as well 
as other genomes if we're not thinking about the mutations elsewhere in the genome that you're causing to occur. But it's those mutations elsewhere in the genome that a mutator causes to occur, those black squares from the earlier picture that on average produce an indirect selective effect that acts to decrease the frequency of a mutator in the population. And so that, in general, will have a downward effect on the mutation rate of a population. One of the earliest papers I'm aware of that talks about mutation rate evolution is a paper by um, Alfred Sturtevant, one of the founders of modern genetics. In 1937, there had already been some findings that suggested that genes could affect the mutation rate. And Sturtevant wrote a paper in which he asked the question, why does the mutation rate not evolve to zero? Uh, and he was asking that question because he thought um, most mutations are deleterious. There should be continual downward pressure on the mutation rate as a consequence of that. Why doesn't it evolve to zero? Um, and he, he says, uh, no answer to this question is available at present other than to say that mutations are accidents and accidents will happen. Um, there are possibilities, though. And let's look at those. Here's one. Obviously, we know that beneficial mutations are rare, but they do occur in populations. And you might imagine that, well, take it to the extreme. A population that has a zero mutation rate has zero beneficial mutations. Uh, that population will be out adapted possibly, by a population that has a non-zero mutation rate because it's producing some beneficial mutations. So in that sort of extremely simplistic way of thinking, we might imagine there's some upward force on the mutation rate caused by beneficial mutations. That upward force is going to depend on the extent to which beneficial mutations remain associated with genes that raise the mutation rate. And we'll be looking at that as we go along. Well, another possible reason why the mutation rate does not evolve to zero, and this was, uh, in, and it was thought about in the mid 20th century, it's been around for a long time, is, um, is what I like to think of as the sort of copy editor argument. So imagine a publish, publishing house. Uh, it wants to produce book volumes that are free of typographical errors. And so it hires one proofreader. Nope didn't get rid of them, and hires another copy editor. Nope. It winds up hiring more and more copy editors to the point where it becomes prohibitively expensive to try to get rid of all errors. And so it settles on some level of error that is the cost of fidelity that it can bear as a publishing house. And you might imagine that there's a physiological and hence selective cost to fidelity for populations that keeps them from evolving a zero mutation rate regardless of whether having mutations would be beneficial or not. The level that's set by the cost of fidelity could be lower than would be needed um, by the need for beneficial mutations, or it could be higher. In fact, I think it is, uh, it is higher, but not because of the cost of fidelity. The guy who was supposed to be here last week, Mike Lynch, I think has what to me is maybe the best argument for why mutation rates are not zero. Um, and that is an interaction between genetic drift and selection. I'm sorry, the colors are changed up here <laughs> compared to this one. They're figures from two different papers, and so the color scheme is totally awry. But what we have here is base pair mutation rate on the y-axis and effective population size on the x-axis. I think probably effective population size has been looked at a little bit in previous lectures. Um, it is the population size that needs to be put into population ge genetic models of natural selection to, to predict gene frequency change. It might not be the same as the census population size of a population. It might differ because of periodic changes in census population size or a difference in um, the abundance of two sexes, all kinds of things. At any rate, 
The effective population size mediates whether selection will actually see genetic variants that affect the physiology of organisms. And to my way of thinking, one of the most beautiful and important um, expressions in population genetics that, that uh, is about the effective population size is this one. Um, for a diploid population, four times the effective population size, n sub e, times the selection coefficient affecting a vari variant that we're interested in must be, you know, solidly greater than one in order for selection to grip a hold of the allele causing that selective difference and change its frequency. If it's less than one, especially if it's substantially less than one, then the random effect of genetic drift controls the frequency of that allele, and it's not that the allele is not seen by selection, despite the fact that it actually makes a physiological difference to organisms. And so what, um, what Mike uh, came up with is, um, and it's not just about mutation rate, it's about genome evolution in general, it's something that um, is now called the drift barrier theory or the drift barrier hypothesis. And so let's look at it for mutation rate evolution here. We know from the big green arrow over here on the left that selection in general, we think, will favor reduced mutation rates. And then the question is, what, at what level will, because no population of organisms on Earth has a non-zero mutation rate, what governs sort of the point at which, or the points at which, selection to reduce the mutation rate is no longer effective? Well. Mike's argument is that what governs it is perhaps genetic drift. So as the mutation rate is reduced to lower and lower and lower levels, the idea is that eventually there comes a point where an allele that reduces the mutation rate a little bit more doesn't any longer satisfy this criterion for NES greater than one. And at that point, selection is powerless to reduce the mutation rate any further. The model predicts then that there should be an inverse relationship between effective population size and mutation rate. Larger effective population size means that selection is better at reducing the mutation rate. Smaller effective population size means that selection is not so good at reducing the mutation rate. And there is some evidence to support um, uh, this idea in the form of studies that Mike and others have done with creatures with different sized genomes. I'm not going to go into that evidence in, in uh, much detail at all, actually. But um, and it occurs to me that I should pro I'll provide you with some of the papers that some of these figures are, are um, from, if you care to read them. Yeah. So I have a naive question. Uh, so does the mutation rate then uh, depend on different organisms or species? So like in chicken, it could be different. In humans, it could be different. Right. So, so the question is, do mutation rates vary among different organisms, different species? Yep, they do. Yeah, I didn't put in here. Why didn't I do that? I have a slide from a 2000 paper. It's old data, but it's still largely correct where we show um, mutation rates of a, a wide variety of organisms. Um, and per base pair and per genome mutation rates are extremely variable across life. Yeah, and, and that, you know, and your question goes to, do we see anything that might, right? Yeah, yeah, we can, we can talk more about that. Uh, seem to have turned this off. I'll run over there and advance it. Oh, <laughs> Microsoft auto update. <laughs> Damn Microsoft. There we go. Okay. Okay, time to take a break and look at some organisms. Um, and I, I'm doing this um, partly to give you a breather and partly it always reminds me to um, say that um, in principle, 
we could study mutation rate evolution experimentally, which is what I'm going to tell you about, experimental studies of mutation rate evolution. We could study it in elephants or whales or whatever. In practice, we can't. Uh, so, and, and this also reminds, this is also sort of my own history of organisms I've worked on, so I want to tell you a little bit about that. I began my career as a biologist by studying bird migration in this bird, which is a North American migrant called the indigo bunting. And we could study mutation rate evolution in that if we had, uh, we could do it by comparing genomes, but directly experimentally we can't. I then worked on transposable element uh, evolution in fruit flies by comparing among genomes. I then worked on natural populations of yeast, which um, we discovered grow on trees in North America and around the world. Um, that's the creature that makes beer and bread and wine for us. It actually lives out there in nature. Most of the study, and I will tell you some work from yeast, but most of the studies I'm going to tell you about are from this unglamorous and stinky organism, E. coli, the bacterium. Um, and the advantage of using something like this is what we'll spend some time talking about. So uh, what my collaborators and I do is to do what's called microbial experimental evolution. There are a couple of ways you can, can do this. Um, one is by what's called serial transfer. So that's where you might have a flask of medium and you grow a culture, and the next day you transfer a certain amount of that culture to a new flask of medium, and then the next day, and then the next day, however long you can keep it going. So that's serial transfer or batch transfer. You can also do it with something called a chemostat, where there's a continuous inflow of fresh medium. The bacteria or yeast are continually running in place. They're always dividing. And um, waste medium drips out at the same rate as inflow. And there's theory that tells you the population will equilibrate at a certain size and so forth. An advantage in either of these is indicated up here with these little cryovials. In either of these kinds of methods, what you can do is, while you're evolving your microbial population, sample from it, mix it with glycerol, put it in the minus 80 centigrade freezer, and you develop, as you do the experiment, a frozen fossil record of the experiment. And a lot of the experimental results I will show you depend on various aspects of, of this, this method, and in particular, the frozen fossil record. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of strengths and limitations of microbial experimental evolution. So what we do with microbial experimental evolution is we take populations of microbes um, and we grow them in the lab. Um, and evolution occurs. Those populations undergo mutation, selection, genetic drift. If there's recombination in the system, they undergo recombination. We have a frozen fossil record. And so some of the strengths of the method, we have experimental replication. We can, we can set up many, many populations and ask if they behave similarly or not. Generally, these organisms have short generation times. In a lot of the experiments I'll show you, there may be seven generations per day. You can get even more than that. That's certainly better than elephants. Um, you have almost complete control of the world in which evolution takes place. You define what that world is. It might not be like the natural world, but at least you know what it is, and you know what the, the evolutionary history of the population in that world is. My friend Alan Orr once told me that he thought experimental evolution was phenomenology to the tenth power, by which he meant a compliment. That is to say, you can look in extreme detail at what happens in populations when you do experimental evolution. When you sample genomes from natural populations, you don't have that kind of detail. And then I already mentioned the living, living fossil record. Well, there are limitations. So obviously, you know, life's been around for about 3.8 billion years and mutating and recombining and undergoing selection and all that. We have a limited time span with which to work in experimental evolution. One of the big limitations is, is captured in this line here. Microbes are different from 
and then pick your favorite other organism, right? So, so we need to be careful in extrapolating from the observed evolution of microbes to evolution of other kinds of populations in nature. And then, of course, depending on how you set up your experiment, there can be a, a lack of ecological complexity. Microbial evolution experiment is anything like as ecologically complex as what goes on in most populations in nature. And to some extent, that's an advantage because then you don't get confused by uh, ecological complexity. But to some extent, it's a disadvantage because you're not really looking at things as they might happen in nature. So what can we learn about through microbial evolution? What really interests me in having done it and still doing it is to learn about evolutionary process here in italics. That process could be something that occurs in any world in principle, in a natural population, in any sort of world we set up in the lab. And so processes such as dynamics of genetic variation under selection, drift, mutation, or recombination, or no recombination, the subject of these lectures, the evolution of the genetic system itself, evolution of mutation rates, recombination rates, and so forth. And things like the roles of chance and history and evolution, we can mess around with the past history of populations. We can introduce chance factors, ask questions. We can also look at, and I know this is a, the subject of a lot of what Paul Rainey does, looking at um, major evolutionary transition moves from unicellular to multicellular organisms and so forth. This is the kind of, these are the kind of things that interest me. We can also look at evolved mechanisms in experimental populations. And these are things that are really particular to the experimental world we've set up. So for example, we might take a strain of E. coli, put it in a growth medium that contains the salts and any vitamin that the E. coli needs and some really weird carbon source, some unusual sugar or whatever. And we might ask, okay, let's evolve this population in that weird sugar. And then let's look at, at the mechanistic level, how the population evolved to be better at eating that sugar, at, at metabolizing that sugar. So all of that is summed up in this. We can characterize at all these levels evolutionary changes in specific organisms and specific environments. There's a ton of this kind of work that's being done, and some of it is expressly applied in the sense of, say, trying to um, evolve organisms that will eat um, environmental contaminants and things like that. I will just say that I don't do this kind of work, and in general, I'm not very interested in it, but, but it, is, uh, it is done and it is important. Okay, we have, by my watch, about three minutes, and so I'm just going to sort of describe this figure, and then, um, and then we'll quit uh, for today. So this is an experiment that was published in 1983, and it's, it's, it's an experiment with E. coli populations, and it, and it illustrates the evolution of mutation rates in E. coli populations. So the very thing we've been sort of building up to. And so these two figures are just the same experiment in different runs, okay? Here we have rep, reps 1 to 4, and here we have reps 5 to 10 of the same experiment. So what was done was to mix together two strains of E. coli, one with a wild-type normal mutation rate, and the other with a defect in a gene called MUT. And that defect elevates the mutation rate of its bearer about 150 fold. And these strains of E. coli were not recombining, that is to say, no individual swap genes with other individuals in these populations, totally asexual. So on the y axis here, you have the log base 10 of the ratio of mute T cells in the population to mute plus. And on the x axis, you have generations. Okay? And this is an experiment done by a man named Lin Chao. <laughs> this experiment has sort of ruled my life for about 20 years because we've done various other versions of this thing. Um, and so what you can see here is that above a certain threshold value, which might be around 10 to the minus fourth, one in 10,000, if the mutator is present at above 
threshold value in frequency in the population, it looks like it will spread toward fixation. And if it's below a certain value of threshold frequency in the population, it looks like it will decline out of the population. You may want to know how the frequency of mutators was assessed in the population. The, the mutator contained a drug resistance factor, which was neutral in and of itself, but allowed Lynn to sample the populations and select so as to just get the mutators and compare that to the total number of cells. And that's how he got these frequency points here. So it's a very simple experiment in a way, but it raises a bunch of interesting questions. Why the threshold? Why does the mutator spread above the threshold? Why does it drop out below the threshold? What does it imply about mutation rate evolution out there in the real world in general? And those questions are things we'll get to in the next lecture.